So today we're going to tackle a significant question in the corporations and human rights debate. Do corporations have human rights or rather should they? Um, what does this say about the human rights system in general? To help answer some of these questions today, I am excited to welcome Professor David White, who has extensive knowledge uh, on the relationship between corporations, corporate power and the law. Thank you so much for joining me today, Professor. Thank you for having me. So there is a rising number of judicial decisions that essentially grant corporations, um, these artificial commercial entities, human rights. Most notably, these rights include the human right to property, but also freedom of expression, right to private family life, religious rights, and so on. This may uh, seem contradictory. Uh, so after all, it's in the name of that human rights are meant for humans. So how did it come to be then that corporations are increasingly invoking these rights before the highest uh, international and national courts? Yeah, I think it's quite a difficult thing for people to get their head around, really. The, the, the corporations, first of all, are persons or are defined in law as persons. And that's the starting point. I'll come back to that in a minute. But the, that they have they are persons with rights, not that they're humans, but that they are persons with uh, rights entitlements. Um, and so the, the the concept of legal personhood is is the important thing here that that there are entities that can have the status of being persons they can be they can be objects and subjects in law mm. without being human persons sentient persons real persons um and the corporation is is it falls into that category it has a status of legal personhood um and that just means that it can kind of um it can be a rights holder, but it can also have other kind of legal attributes that go along with having a single identity in law. Um, and we'll maybe come back to that in 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 the discussion. But but within um, the European Convention of Human Rights, for example, corporations are included as legal persons. They have the same status as you or I. To, to claim to claim rights at uh, uh, the um, European Court of Human Rights. It's not entirely consistent. The Inter-American Court is different. It doesn't accept uh, corporate um, personhood or legal personhood in that way, and corporations cannot claim rights in the same way. What happens in the Inter-American Court is that shareholders tend to claim their rights, and so in a de facto way, the corporation's rights is, are claimed through the, through the shareholder. Um, or if we look at the, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, actually there were, was a debate at the outset, and I think it was proposed by France, that, that, that corporations should also have personhood for the purposes of the Rome Statute, and that would enable corporations to be prosecuted as criminals in the International Criminal Court. That was thrown out in the early stages. So it's not entirely consistent. Um, and, and and some have argued that, that actually it's it works one way, that corporations have rights as as legal subjects, but they can't, uh, but they very rarely are, are treated fully, as, as we saw in the, in the example of the Rome Statute in the International Criminal Court. Okay, so the question of uh, corporations as uh, simultaneous bearers of human rights and human rights responsibilities is highlighted by the UN efforts uh, to create a legally binding yeah. treaty on business and human rights. And there are obviously countless uh, examples of corporations violating human rights, yet they have um, managed to sort of steer away from obligations and made it so that they have rights instead. Um, how will the fact that they have uh, recognized uh, rights influence and affect uh, corporate responsibilities in human rights law? I mean, the, the, uh, one of the, the things to say is that there isn't necessarily a connection, that you can have rights without responsibilities. And, and that's exactly, I mean, the, the, the purpose of your question is, is, I think that's the point we get to, that very often corporations violate human rights um, but of course only states can be held accountable in human rights law for violations of human rights so you have a, a, a situation where corporations have rights 
but not responsibilities within human rights law. That that's absolutely um, correct. But I think the issue is is all, almost kind of wider than this because because the the fact that corporations can claim this status as persons gives them the ability to compromise rights in all kinds of ways that we that we don't normally kind of kind of think of right so even in a in an ordinary employment contract what you know when i enter into my my employer is a, is a single entity it's not a profit making corporation it's a university um but most of us have an employment relationship with a legal person whether it's a profit making company or a public body it, it it's it, so that when we try and you know negotiate conditions around our contract then we stand up to them as individuals right and of course this is we don't we don't negotiate with the with the, the director or the owner but with this abstract corporate person and that makes it very difficult for us to kind of um to be able to make some kind of gains out of that that situation because the corporate entities are very has a very very powerful kind of um status in 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 that sense and ultimately the investors or even the senior managers that stand behind the corporation will never be held responsible for the things that the corporation does so that's a kind of deeper level to your to your question and and that and that's the the case also in human rights uh, law where you know for example a british oil company in africa or in latin america is colluding with paramilitary organizations which has happened in the, in in the past um that they that they don't have they're very rarely held accountable for that because their responsibilities are removed several stages down the line and and at the end there's a corporate veil that this that's what cor corporate lawyers call it the corporate veil that protects the legal person from the real persons that either direct the actions of the corporation or benefit the most from 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 their profits so you can be an investor in a in a british oil company committing human rights violations in in colombia or or ecuador and you you know that you will never be held to account for that i mean it it, it doesn't even compute in conceptual terms that a shareholder would ever be held accountable for for corporate human rights violations so that's a very important mechanism that allows individuals to escape responsibility whereas at the same time corporations can claim rights can can claim rights in in the, exactly the same situation yeah that kind of um seems to me that they get the the best of both worlds the best of both options like they the corporation as an entity is is protected within human rights law but by granting them human rights, whereas on the other hand, they are still lacking these obligations and there is still, when there needs to be, there is a corporate veil protecting the, the shareholders and the corporation itself. So very, and I, as you mentioned, I think it really highlights the, the position of uh, power disparity between like, obviously corporations as very powerful entities um, and the human that is essentially, um, in my opinion at least, is supposed to be protected by uh, by the human rights law system. Um, right. So in your uh, in your uh, article, uh, the human rights for profit, uh, you um, mentioned uh, system preserving tendencies of human rights, and to counter that, uh, system threatening uh, tendencies of human rights. Can you explain those two terms a bit more? Yeah, I mean the the idea is is that when when we look at the effect of of human rights law on corporations, ultimately the the the, the balance of um, outcomes that that we tend to see from courts preserves the system. It pre it preserves um, the 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 dominant system of power relationships that we have. That's often described as capitalism or the, the 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 capitalist system and ultimately within a capitalist system that's that that is the role of not just human rights law but the, but the legal system that that it, the outcome tends to preserve the system rather than undermine the system and i think people sometimes make the mistake that human rights law can challenge the system that produces human rights violations in the first place and and really 
I think when you when you look at, at the way that corporations use human rights law, you realize that that's not really possible. Other people have, have made this precisely the same point when it applies to individuals that that actually, although human rights law can in a very limited way protect people against torture, for example, it doesn't change the system that produces torture in the first place. And so that's the the system preserving aspect of it. And and really when we talk about the kinds of things that corporations do, um, we need to challenge the system because they're systemically produced. And I think that's um that's quite clear if we if we come back to thinking about a concrete example. So thinking about how rights are are upholding what corporations do, I, I mentioned the oil industry in, in, in Latin America. I mean, there have been eight cases in total taken by corporations invoking their rights, not through human rights, not through the Inter-American Human Rights Court, but through another process which through which corporations are able to uphold their, their rights or pursue rights claims. The ISDS, the, the investor state, dispute settlement system. So that's where uh, corporations can say that their their rights within bilateral investment treaties have been compromised because a country has made a, a law or has taken a regulatory action. Um, so that's, that's happened, that challenge has happened eight times in Ecuador by oil companies who are complaining about, about either taxes being imposed or about resources from oil being redirected towards public good and, and a rising number of cases um, are being invoked by by corporations involved in climate related cases to to protect their rights to produce oil or their rights to to retain the earnings from fossil fuels oil gas and coal um so in in that sense you know we have we have a situation where the system, is not being challenged, right? The system is being preserved, and that system has to, is actually a system that we that we know now that we need we need to change, right? We can't preserve a system that keeps producing fossil fuels, and we certainly can't protect companies' rights to produce to keep producing fossil fuels at the rate they're producing um, the the climate change at. So, so we. This is a, a kind of connection between the way that rights are used to preserve the status quo and, and actually the way that rights are used to preserve a system which is which is ultimately killing us. So I think that's, for me, that's the importance of making the point that various forms of corporate rights are being upheld in ways that are system preserving and, and, and really fatally damaging for, for the planet and for, for all of us. Hmm. So how do these uh, developments within uh, corporate uh, human rights impact the credibility of the human rights system? Is it still safe to assume that human rights are meant for the protection of the lives and dignity of human beings? Or um, do you think that they have been delegitimized by their appropriation by these um, commercial profit-making entities that are so often associated with human rights abuses? Yeah, I, I mean, I think they are delegitimized. The, the, the problem is who the audience is here, right? Because I imagine not many people know that corporations frequently invoke their rights to, to privacy or, you know, their, their rights to enjoy property within the European Court of Human Rights. I think, I mean, everyone I mention this to, you know, when I say, look, anything upwards of 4% of cases that go through the European Court of Human Rights involve corporations protecting uh, and invoking and defending their rights, people are very, very surprised. So it, maybe it delegitimizes the system, I would argue it does, but to delegitimize something, there needs to be an audience, there needs to be an audience that it's either legitimate or not. Um, legitimate for, and I think most people don't don't know about this. But I think there's a broader question which comes back to the system preserving, system challenging thing. I mean, one of the things that the the UN human rights system has clearly failed to do since since it was introduced in uh, sort of since the adoption of the UN Declaration on Human Rights in 1948 is that it that it, nothing has it hasn't changed anything fundamental in in 
relation to the ability of people to exercise their rights in many parts of the world and in some parts of the world pe people are even worse off in terms of their their let's just say their civil and political rights their rights not to be um placed under surveillance or their their rights not to be oppressed politically or not to be imprisoned uh, and tortured and so on that you know these these things have by no means been eradicated since 1948 and i think that really challenges the legitimacy and and should make us question a bit more uh about the fundamentals of the human rights system about whether whether it really is the the the, the great guarantor of rights that we that, that many many mainstream lawyers still claim it is and 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 seems to be you know if you if you think about what the kind of the mainstream textbook liberal understanding of the human rights system is people still regard it as something which does and can effectively protect um, individuals' rights. And I'm, I don't want to be too negative because there are many parts of the world where people use rights as, as a focus for their struggle. And these struggles may well very often are, are successful. They're able to challenge states particularly sometimes uh, corporations but but they're able to challenge uh, using the language of rights and using the kind of the if you like rights as a as a, as a rallying call or as a, a focus for for those struggles but i would say that 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 you know without having the chance to go into detailed examples the only examples i can think of of where rights struggles have been successful are those of those struggles that have been successful because of the strength of the campaigns and the struggles and the people and the social forces from below that are behind those. You know, that I, I, it's not about rights. Right struggles are not successful because of rights. They're, they're successful because of the struggles and, 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 and the way that people can join together. Um, so I think we, we, you know, so what does that mean? We need to be a bit careful about relying too much on on human rights as something that's going to save us or going to protect us, um, and and also at the same time, which has been the basis of our discussion, always highlighting the contradictions, uh, the contradictions that allow human rights violators to claim their rights fairly regularly, even if people don't know about that that widely. And I think that does delegitimize the system. Would you like to uh, offer some concluding thoughts or if there's anything that you would like to mention that I haven't asked you about? Um, just I, I think it's very concerning that, that corporations, particularly fossil fuel corporations, now are increasingly using the law as a battleground to protect their rights to continue to profit from fossil fuels. And there's a couple of cases in the Netherlands Um that, that are going on um there's 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 also um a, a kind of range of challenges to state policy that's going on and there's a kind of chilling it's a kind of chilling process going on and i think i you know i think most people think we must be beyond that that the fossil fuel companies should not be trying to dictate policy never mind claiming rights uh, at the moment so i think if there's one thing that we could do in this discussion is is to to very very clearly um say that fossil fuel companies particularly don't have any say over the way in which rights should be upheld and i don't think that private corporations really have have a say should have a say in that human rights should be about protecting human persons even if that's not going to uh, really at the end of the day protect everyone but certainly a start would be to get rid of of corporations um, from the human rights courts and make sure that they can't invoke rights like like human persons. Mm. Completely thank agreed. Uh, thank you so much, Professor, uh, for sharing uh, your fascinating opinions and uh, knowledge on this topic. Thank you, Nina, and thanks for and thanks for going deep into this subject because it's really it is really important. Thank you. Thank you.